very warm welcome to you wherever you are around the world right now. This is another live Action for Happiness event and it's fantastic to see you joining us as ever from so many different countries around the world. This Action for Happiness community is all about building a happier and kinder world together and I'm so excited that we're joined today by Dr Shauna Shapiro for this theme of rewire your mind. Um, Shauna, are you there? Are you with us? I'm hoping Shauna is going to be joining me on screen. Hi, well, welcome Shauna, lovely to see you. You're muted unfortunately at the moment. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Sorry, I thought there was an introduction, but here I am. <laughs> welcome. Um, well, by way of introduction, uh, many of you here in this community are uh, regulars and so uh, it's lovely to have you here. We're going to be um, looking forward to your comments in the chat as always, and we'll be keeping it kind and supportive and relevant, as I know you always do. If you're new to one of these Action for Happiness events, thank you for being here. Shauna and I are going to have a conversation together where I'm going to try and help bring to life and, and, and help Shauna share some of the fantastic work that she does um, as a clinical psychologist. She's a renowned author. She has a TED Talk that's been viewed three million times an expert in neuroscience and also mindful and compassionate practices, some of which we'll have a chance to learn about and try out hopefully together at today's event. And then after we've had a conversation, you'll have a chance to put your questions to Shauna. So please do use the Q&A function as well as the chat and we'll be able to answer some of those a bit later on. So rewire your mind is the theme and Shauna maybe to lead us into the conversation, perhaps you could say a little bit for people who aren't familiar with you about your own background and professional experience, but also maybe personally what's brought you to this topic. Yeah, well, thank you for that introduction and I'm delighted to be here. And um, yeah, for me, even though this has been kind of a academic and professional pursuit, it really started as a personal one. Um, when I was 17 years old, I had spinal fusion surgery. So I had a metal rod put in my spine and I went from this healthy, active teenager. I was star of the volleyball team. I had just signed a play in, in university um, to overnight lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. And I was in the hospital bed for about six months. And it was a very difficult time. And as a teenager, I just didn't have the tools to cope. I was in a lot of physical pain, which was hard. Um, but what was really challenging was my own mind, right? This this kind of fear, would I ever walk normally again? Would I always be in pain? A lot of fears about the future and also a lot of regrets. Like, I wish I'd done that, or if only I'd done this. And I started getting really anxious, really depressed. And um, it was during that time, my father, who was a long, lifelong meditator, gave me a book, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn's book, Wherever You Go, There You Are. And I'll never forget, I opened the book and the first line says, whatever has happened to you, it's already happened. The only thing that matters is now what? And it was as if this kind of whole path opened up for me, this possibility that I didn't have to stay stuck and that this wasn't, you know, my life forever. And so I started reading everything I could about mindfulness and trying to practice on my own, which I have to say I wasn't very good at. Um, and a few years later, when I had recovered enough, I went to Thailand to begin really studying meditation. And it was my experiences there at the monastery that kind of set me on this path for kind of a lifelong, both personal and professional kind of career in mindfulness. Well, that's lovely to hear. And I, I love that idea of whatever's happened has happened. And I know you you talk a lot about that the sort of hope that comes with that, that there is a possibility of change. And we'll come on to talk about that. But perhaps we could actually begin as we mean to go on in this event today and actually practice a little bit of mindfulness. So I'd love to invite you to sort of take us through a little exercise, but maybe you could just remind us about some of the or some of how you would describe the, the you know, the, the both the art uh, of mindfulness and, and why it matters. Yeah, I think it's really important to take a moment and define mindfulness. It's become so popular. Um, and yet the term is kind of thrown around and we often don't have a shared understanding. Um, so from, from my perspective, um, first, it's important to differentiate mindfulness from meditation. So 
mindfulness is really this way of being present moment by moment. So right now we're practicing mindfulness as we're speaking, as we're listening. Um, meditation is kind of the exercise, right? It's, as you said, the practice, it's like going to the gym and it's um, really, you know, the only point to meditation really is to cultivate this ability to be present. And so mindfulness is really about attention, like at the most basic level, uh, it's the art of paying attention. And yet it's a bit more nuanced than that. Because if you think about it, you know, just paying attention, there's lots of people, a sniper could, <laughs> you know, be the most mindful person in the world, they know how to pay attention. So it's also about why you pay attention. And this is your intention, right? What's important to you? What do you care about? And then how you pay attention. And this is your attitude. This has to do with paying attention with kindness, with curiosity, with an open mind. And so mindfulness is really all three of these. It's kind of the awareness that arises when we pay attention on purpose, intentionally, in a kind and compassionate way. And I'll, I'll take you through just a brief three-minute practice in a moment with each of those. But one thing I really want to say about intention, because I've been studying it quite a lot lately, and I, I think it's such an important part of this practice, is that our intentions set the stage for what is possible they remind us moment by moment of what's actually important. And what's fascinating about intentions is that they're not just kind of these vague mystical concepts, they're also neurochemicals. And so when you set an intention, it releases this whole cascade of neurochemistry that helps motivate you to reach your goal. So when you set an intention, it releases the neuromodulator of dopamine, and dopamine is this, you know, molecule of motivation. And then dopamine turns into acetylcholine, which helps you focus and pay attention. And the kind of hallmark of neuroplasticity, it, it doesn't happen unless you're focused and paying attention. And so by setting an intention, you basically are, you know, guiding yourself in the direction you want to head. So as I guide you through this practice, what I want you to do is take a moment, let your eyes close or just lower your gaze, whatever feels comfortable. And begin by just listening for your intention, which is, why are you here? What's important? Why are you paying attention? And you don't need to come up with an answer. I just want you to practice listening, feeling your body. And maybe you're here to learn, right? Or maybe you're here to find more peace or ease in your life. Or maybe you're here for more clarity, right? You have some struggle or confusion that you'd like more clarity with. So just kind of listening for your intention, what's important right now. Feeling your breath, feeling your body. And just choosing a word or a phrase to guide you. It could just be presence. And if you haven't thought of something, don't worry. Your intention can be simply to keep listening with kindness. And then just letting that go and gathering your attention here in the present moment into your body. So go ahead and wiggle your fingers and toes just to kind of help anchor your attention. Maybe roll out your shoulders. Go ahead and soften your jaw. Soften your eyes. Just let the face rest. And notice that you're breathing. And then see if you can infuse this attention with an attitude of kindness, of curiosity, of, of wonder. Like, I wonder what's going to happen. Noticing how you feel, how you feel in your body. Are you tired? Are you interested? Are you hungry? Resting with your breath. We'll just rest here for another 30 seconds. Beginning again, right here at the very end. See if you can begin fresh, paying attention with kindness and curiosity. And 
And when you're ready, slowly, gently, you can let some light back in through the eyes. Go ahead and just stretch your arms above your head if that feels good. I always like to do it. <laughs> okay, good. And what I most want you to notice is that even as the meditation ends, the mindfulness continues, that we're still paying attention with our kindness, with our curiosity. And the goal is really to have this seamless continuity of mindfulness, that there's no like huge break between the meditation and the mindfulness. Right. Thank you, Shona. Um, one thing I particularly love about that was we always have such a, an active chat in the community of these events. And actually, people really pause then to connect with <laughs> what you're doing. So thank you, everyone, for really being part of that and obviously seeing a lot of, um, uh, you know, love for you in the chat afterwards as well, Shona. Um, I uh, that desire to find an intention was really interesting for me because I as well as discovering what I would expect, which is like the intention to perhaps be present and to feel calmer, I discovered that my intention in doing that was also to, to ensure that I can host this event in a way that both helps bring out your wonderful work and helps everyone in the community feel that they've learned something. And I, and I recognized that that was a sort of a compassionate instinct that I hadn't seen before, that that was part mm -hmm. of why I was there. So I, I think that idea of intention actually changed how I experienced that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love that you brought that up, actually, because whenever I'm doing this and I'm teaching, my intention is always, may this be of benefit. And what I find is when I anchor into that intention, it kind of relaxes my anxiety, like it helps me let go of my agenda. I don't have to have it go perfectly. I don't have to make sure we cover this. I just have to, in some way, have this be of benefit. And it really reminds me of what's truly important. Yeah. Mm. Well, talking about what's truly important, we've rather ambitiously called this event Rewire Your Mind. And I know that's a phrase you've used a lot. We've talked about mindfulness already. I guess the idea of rewiring your mind is that we can change. But of course, we tend to associate that more. Maybe we'll talk about this a bit later. Perhaps with young people and when we're children, we can change a lot. But as adults, we sort of often have the impression that we are fixed in our ways. And I think you can bring a sort of hopeful message to us. But maybe we could start with this idea of change, and whether it really is possible. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the most hopeful and important scientific discoveries in the last 400 years um, of brain science is really neuroplasticity. This discovery that change is possible throughout our entire lifetime, that even into our 90s, right, and even into our ninth decade, we're seeing neurogenesis. So this understanding of really our miraculous brain and how malleable it is I think is the most hopeful message science can give you. Because for me as a clinical psychologist, what we were always taught, I remember in graduate school, it was called the doctrine of the unchanging brain. And it was this belief that the brain was static and that it was fixed. And after age 25, it was like, this is who you are. And that's not such good news because most of the people I was working with were clinically depressed or anxious or stuck in some way in their life. And what has been so hopeful about this new research is it shows that no matter what your past, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what your current circumstances, all of us have the capacity to change. Now, I want to be clear, it's not like flipping a switch right? where you instantly light up the good and shut down the bad. It takes practice. And I think that's why I've become so interested in this whole notion of rewiring the mind, that it's over time that we can carve out new pathways. And I kind of like to think of it as, you know, we have these super highways of habit. It's how we've been practicing our life for decades. And a lot of times those are unhealthy habit patterns, both in the way that we behave, but also in the way that we think and our worldviews. And with mindfulness practice, with compassion practice, with all these different practices, we start to carve out these new pathways. And I like to call them country roads, right? They're, they're not as fast. They're not as like slick as the super highway. But as we start to go down these new pathways, they start to become their own super highways and they lead somewhere new, right? If we want to go somewhere new, we have to take a different path. Yeah. Mm, I love that. I, well, I love that the optimism that's sort of built into that, that change is possible. And I think I've heard you say the phrase that it's never too late. And clearly, if you can change in your 90s, then, then there's, there's a chance wherever we are in our journey. Uh, this superhighways of habit is really interesting. So 
I, I, I often think we forget how helpful habits are in a way because they sort of, the, the fact that so many of us are stuck on autopilot is mm -hmm. in some ways a good thing because there's so many decisions and so much information all around us. The fact that we can get ourselves up and to work and eat and all these things without having to think about it too much is a helpful response to a really complicated life. It takes out some of the variables. The fact also that we can then find these country, country lanes and take a different path is exciting. But how, how can we maybe identify the super highways of habit we'd like to get off as opposed to the ones that are perhaps serving us in helpful ways? <laughs> well, I think for most people, it's relatively obvious which are their super highways of habits that are not serving them, that are not skillful. Um, so I can say for me, one of my, my main ones is impatience mm. and that you can speak with my husband and my four teenagers and they will <laughs> reinforce that notion that, that that's something I'm working on. And, and so I think all of us know kind of what our areas of growth maybe are. And so for me, every time I start going down that well-practiced, very speedy, impatient pathway, if I can pause and I can just for a moment go down this one, what happens, which is so exciting, what happens in my brain is something called neuronal pruning. So it starts to prune away my superhighway and it starts to grow this other pathway. And, you know, habits, I think you're right in the sense that we don't think of, we think of habits often as bad, right? Mm -hmm. That, that they're, they're negative. Um, but actually when we can create really healthy habits and the reason the word habit is so important is that it's automatic. And so there's this interesting paradox with mindfulness where on one level, you want to wake up from your automatic, you know, way of living this autopilot, like you said. And then on the other hand, you want to start to create healthy habits where you stack them in with other habits and you minimize limbic friction. So limbic friction is kind of, it's like when you're trying to start a new exercise program and you're thinking about going to work out, but you're not sure you want to, and you're like hemming and hawing, that's limbic friction. It's difficult. But mm -hmm. if you just set the time and you know, you're going to work out and you have to work out because you're going to work out next door to where you pick your kids up and you're gonna do it at this time, it, it minimizes limbic friction because the decision is already made. And so the key really to creating these new pathways is to as best we can eliminate the decision to make these choices part of our daily life. I and that's why, that. I'm, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I just, um, I, it helps remind me of some of the biggest changes I've made, whether it's about no longer drinking alcohol or building activity into my daily life or my meditation practice in the morning. It's become almost a binary thing for me. It's like, this is, this is something I do as opposed to something I'm trying to do. Uh, yeah. And actually that, that was quite interesting, but I wonder maybe on your point about waking up and, bringing awareness maybe we could just turn to the community for a second and actually ask people what what's one super highway of habit that you would love to sort of nudge in a different direction maybe we could just see some examples you shared one about um you know your your own perspective my one I guess is I can be quite judgmental to myself and potentially to others and I'd like to let go of some of that maybe people just share in the chat I'm going to read a few of these out procrastination quit sugar get out of my head um, I'm anticipating the worst. I have political rage, rumination, negativity, apologizing for myself. And you were I worried they wouldn't know their, their habits. Yeah, I mean, so, so we clearly <laughs> they, they know. <laughs> food as an escape, living in the future, feeling not good enough, overthinking, not making enough plans, feeling impatient, inaction. Um, wow, I mean, this is an amazing list and actually quite diverse, quite a range of different sort of super highways. So it's not that everyone's saying the same thing. Someone saying judgmental and impatient, negative judgment, having a thin skin to criticism, feeling lazy. So thank you, everyone. That's really insightful, I think. Uh, what are you thinking? As you and, I, and I want to say, so, yes, so I'm thinking so many things. So first of all, thank you so much for the participation. I love hearing those and I relate to so many of them. And what it brings up for me is this kind of universality of our own self-judgment. And so I want to be really clear right now, because this for me has been the most important part of transformation and the most important part of my work with my patients, but really in my work with myself, is as we see these super highways of habit that we want to change, we have to be really careful not to spiral into self-judgment, mm -hmm. that we're seeing them with this pure intention of, you know, um, 
may, may I change this 5% more? Not 100%, not perfection. Perfection isn't possible. In fact, perfection is the antithesis of evolution. So my goal is not perfection, it's growth, it's change, it's transformation. And so as you, you know, were writing in the chat and saying what you wanted to change, it's really important then to bring compassion to yourself, right? To not judge yourself, well, God, you're such a terrible and patient mother, but to say, oh, sweetheart, you, you really want to be more patient with your kids and with your husband and with the world. So how can I take one small step in this direction? And what I find is that this mindfulness is about seeing things clearly, right? To see them clearly without shame, without self-judgment. And this is so important because when we shame and judge ourselves, it shuts down the learning centers of the brain. It literally keeps us stuck in the very super highway of habit that we want to change. And so the, the real kind of secret sauce of, of transformation is actually compassion, is seeing things clearly with kindness instead of judgment. And what's interesting about kindness and compassion is they release both dopamine, which we talked about, this neuromodulator of motivation. So they give you energy to change and oxytocin, which makes you feel safe. You're like, oh, I'm not going to beat myself up if I see this clearly. I'm actually going to use the little bit of pain I feel at seeing it to motivate me. So it's a really important distinction. I, I, I also think the fact you focus on the intention almost more than the outcome to start with, at least, it, it feels helpful because I know that sometimes I, so let's say I have an intention to be a good father and you know, I've got teenage kids and it's you know, hard work and I feel like I make the wrong judgments and say the wrong things and make mistakes. And I find it really helpful to be able to say, well, that maybe, maybe that didn't go quite as well as I'd hoped. But my intention was good. I was trying to connect or help or pass a message on and I can learn from that. So it, instead of it becoming like a, I failed in my aim, it's become a, okay, well, I'm bringing in the right intention to this. And I'm, you know, my, I'm still trying to be a good me, a good father, a good parent, and yeah. I'm learning. And so it feels like yeah, more like an evolution rather than a perfection, as you were saying. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, that has been so important in my own work is, is always coming back to my good heart. Like I wasn't trying to be, you know, this, or I wasn't trying to make a mistake. None of us want to, you know, do these things and, and to have compassion for myself, but not let the compassion let me off the hook. And I want to be really clear about that. It's like the, the coming back to the truth, right? But that still means we see clearly. And that's why I love integrating mindfulness and compassion so much that mindfulness is really about this seeing clearly. But then I find when I'm seeing clearly that little judgmental voice can get in there if I don't explicitly bring in compassion. So what can we just build on? I mean, people were so generous in sharing one of their super highways. Let's, let's go to the, the so what, you know, you said earlier, whatever's happened has happened, now what? So what, what's the beginning of someone, let's say someone said that they are procrastinating or feeling lazy or feeling whatever it was that we were shared. Where, where do we begin in that sort of, you know, the gentle, kind, but, but not letting yourself off the hook approach to change? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the first step, I think, is really seeing things clearly, as mm -hmm. I said, and really looking. Um, and that's where, for me, the compassion comes in, because sometimes it's just too painful to, to look, to acknowledge those parts of ourselves, right? They're so shameful. And so what happens is compassion brings the kind of the courage and this light of awareness, even to our darkest places. Um, so that's the, the first so, step. Can I paraphrase? Are we sort of saying like, it's kind of understandable that we're in this situation. We're not berating ourselves. What It is what it is almost before you can move on from right. it. So, so the first step, and you know, I actually like to use Kristen Neff's not model, um, very much in terms of, of using compassion, because the first part of self-compassion is mindfulness. That that's the first step of the model. And so the first step is just seeing things clearly. You can't, you can't change if you don't see it. So the first mm -hmm. step is seeing it. And what I love about this step too, is there's wonderful research out of UCLA that shows that when you name an emotion, it actually starts to calm down your physiology. So we affectionately call it name it to tame it. And this is a wonderful study where they had, um, 
they had people look at very difficult slides, uh, photographs, and half the people had to name the emotion that they felt when they saw it. And the other half had to name whether it was a male or female in the slide. So it was like people in accidents or people who were starving or, you know, terrible things. And so the group that was like, ooh, fear or disgust or shame or overwhelm, they were hooked up to all these EEG, EKG monitors, all these physiological monitors. And what they found is naming your emotion started to calm your physiology immediately. And so the first step, I think, in any difficult situation is just to name it, just to say, this is a moment of suffering, or I'm afraid, or I'm angry, or I'm embarrassed, whatever it is. The second step then is not to go about trying to fix it yet, right? Which is what we normally try to do. We're like, ah, I made a mistake. I got to fix it. Is to pause and bring compassion to yourself, bring kindness to yourself, and to really treat yourself like you would treat a dear friend, right? What would I say if, if Mark messed up? How would I comfort you? And to bring that same compassion to myself. And I want to be clear with this step because when I was first practicing self-compassion, I would imagine what someone who loves me would say. So I'd imagine like my best friend, Annie, what would she say? Or my mom. And that didn't really work because I'd be like, oh yeah, well, she loves me. So of course she's just being nice. What actually shifted my perspective is when I imagined, what would I say to Annie? And then all my love and compassion for her naturally arose and it shifted my entire experience. And then the final step, which is, is really, I think, um, the most important is what's called common humanity. And this is where you reflect on all the other people in the world that are struggling with something similar. So when you were reading the list from the chat section and people were talking about their self-judgment and their not being good enough and their, you know, their, their laziness and all these different things, I was like, ah, I relate. And then all of a sudden I realized there's all these hundreds of people right now that are struggling with something similar. And so in my practice, what I do is I'll send out my compassion to all these people who are struggling. So maybe someone's struggling with their teenagers, like you mentioned, yeah. I'll say, may all parents struggling with teenagers, may you find compassion for yourself and may this pass quickly. May this stage, you know, be easeful. And then I'll breathe in that those same wishes to myself. So I'm sending my compassion out, but I'm not leaving myself out. I'm also breathing it back in for myself. And, you know, I've, I've worked a lot with women with breast cancer. I worked at the cancer center for a long time. And this step, this final step was the most transformational is we'd start by, you know, being mindful of our emotions and our fear and our, you know, anger and whatnot. And then we'd bring kindness to ourselves. But it was when they thought of all the other women who are facing breast cancer or facing chemotherapy or the radiation or the surgery, and they sent their compassion out to them and they breathed it in for themselves. There was this sense of community. And that's where you could really see the healing start to happen. Mm. Sean, I think the self-compassion is so important. And so you've, I'm just going to recap. We said mindfulness, compassion, and common humanity. I think I've got a really strong sort of intellectual understanding of how you've described those things, but I wondered if maybe we could now practice it together. Maybe you could actually take us through another of your fantastic mindful exercises and perhaps each of us could bring to mind something we're really working on or struggling with and actually really, really not just hear this in our heads, but actually feel this in our hearts as well. Absolutely. And I so appreciate that, Mark, because to rewire our mind, which remember, that's the name of the talk. That's what we're doing here. You can't just hear about it. And even having an insight like, oh, that makes sense. That doesn't translate into learning and long-term change. What actually translates is practice. That's why one of my favorite phrases is what you practice grows stronger. And it's true. So we need to practice. So again, you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. And just like Mark invited, just call to mind something you're struggling with. Something maybe that you listed in the chat or something else. And I want you to notice first just how it feels to think about this thing. So it probably doesn't feel great. So that's okay. <laughs> that's natural. And just kind of being mindful of the pain or the suffering or the fear or the confusion. See if you can soften the body, create space for whatever you're feeling. And just gently naming it. Sadness, fear, 
anger, confusion, whatever it is, just naming it. See if you can feel it in your body, this kind of signature of emotion. You don't have to think about the problem too much. I just want you to be aware of it, its impact. Feeling your breath, let the breath anchor you. And now I want you to imagine what you would say to a dear friend who is facing something similar. So a dear friend who is feeling afraid or scared or sad, what would you say to them? How would you support and comfort them? And I want you just really to imagine silently in your mind's eye what you would say, how you would approach them. Maybe you would hug them, put your arm around them. And I want you to see if you can bring the same kindness to yourself. For me, it's helpful just to put my hand on my heart and just say, sweetheart, this is hard. I'm here. I care about your pain. So see if you can offer yourself those phrases or whatever feels right. And again, this isn't about perfect. It's about practice. So 5% more kindness towards yourself. Feel your breath, feel your body. See if you can receive this a little bit. And then you can place your hand back in your lap or leave it there. But I want us to shift now to reflecting on everyone else in the world right now who might be facing something similar. Of course, it's not the exact same, but there's probably other people who feel lonely right now or who feel scared or who's struggling financially or with their health. So just reflecting on all the other people who are facing something similar to you and send them your kindness, your compassion. May your suffering pass. I care about your suffering. And as you send this out with each exhale, breathing it back in with each inhale, sending your compassion out with each exhale, breathing it in with each inhale, and recognizing that you're part of a larger humanity that we're never alone in our suffering. We're part of this web of life from which we can never fall. And so take one more breath in and out. Take a moment just to feel your body and notice what's happened in just a few minutes. As you're ready, you can slowly, gently let your eyes open. And again, you can just stretch your arms if that feels good. Okay, good. Thank you, Shauna. I, I don't think I've ever called myself sweetheart before. <laughs> Thank you for that opportunity. Um, I want to come on to uh, the idea of, you know, bringing this to the next generation. I know you've written a fantastic book, um, sort of bringing some of your ideas to, to young people, but just, I guess, because it's linked to it, I just wanted to pause for a moment a bit more on this idea of practice. We've just done a practice. I found that really wonderful. And hearing about the theory was great, but then feeling it was, and experiencing it was different. Um, you know, obviously lots of us would love to spend, you know, time every day doing mindfulness and you know I'm, I feel fortunate I've managed to build a practice that doesn't always go to plan but has become a routine mm -hmm. I love that quote that says you should meditate for oh, whatever it is half an hour a day except on stressful days when you should make it an hour right <laughs> <laughs> um but of course we don't all have that much time so how, do you have any tips on how we can make practice something that fits yeah. in our busy days yeah, absolutely. And it's something that I have really thought a lot about. Um, I was a single mom for 10 years and um, it was a very stressful, very busy time where I did not have a lot of my own free time. And so I was very interested in like how many minutes a day to get to a threshold effect and the science behind it. And here's what I'll say. Um, 
one you have to do what works in your life. And I know that's cliche and that's what everyone says, but it's true. And so the best time to practice is when it actually works into your life. Now, having said that, there's some interesting research. So in terms of when to practice, uh, there's some great research from uh, UC San Francisco. My dear friend and colleague, Alyssa Eppel, um, has found that your mood in the morning and your mood in the evening predict the length of your telomeres, which are the little caps at the end of our DNA that predict really our overall health and longevity, and also the health of our mitochondria, which is the body's kind of battery or energy system. And what they found is that your mood in the morning and your mood in the evening, these kind of bookends time of day predict these really important health indicators. And so what I take from that is that meditating in the morning and in the evening are these really potent times that can support your health. And so I've made that my practice um, now to meditate for short periods in the morning and short periods in the evening. Um, in terms of length of time, you know, I came from the tradition I studied with John Kabat-Zinn, you know, back in, gosh, my really early 20s. Um, and we were, you know, 45 minutes a day was, was the, the thing. And I have put thousands of my patients through that um, regimen. And if you can do what you practice grows stronger, it's wonderful for you. But newer research is showing that there is a threshold effect. Originally, um, we found between seven and 12 minutes a day where we are seeing changes in the brain, changes in immune function, changes in health and well-being. Um, Andrew Huberman, who's another dear colleague of mine at Stanford, um, recently published a study showing that five minutes a day, five days a week, um, was enough to see change. So what I do with my patients is we always start with just one or two minutes a day, because what's most important of getting back to this idea of habit formation is to build the habit, is to start to interrupt your automatic pilot, to interrupt your patterning. And so what we do is we stack the meditation habit onto a habit that you already do. So I usually choose brushing my teeth, right? Something that I really don't ever miss. <laughs> and so in the morning, before I brush my teeth or right after, that's my cue. Oh, it's time to meditate. And before bed. So there's this Again, I talked about limbic friction. There's less limbic friction because you don't have to decide when am I going to meditate? It's right now. It's while, you know, right after I brush my teeth and it helps to um, start to build that practice. And if you're just doing two minutes, no one can say I don't have two minutes, right? And so as you start to link that practice, then after 30 days, you can say, oh, I want to do five minutes or I want to do seven minutes. But the most important thing is to get that pathway established. And so that's usually where I start. Yes, and I, I, I really love that suggestion of the teeth cleaning. Other ones I've heard are while the kettle's boiling, that might be a uniquely British thing, perhaps. Um, <laughs> one no, I use, when, I first, when I first wake up, I will put the meditation app on my phone before I do any other connectivity in the morning. Um, I've also done a thing where I set an alarm at midday every day that just goes off and only I know what it is, but I know it's my reminder just to take a mindful minute at midday, wherever I am. And, you know, um, no one else needs to even know that that's going on for me. I also love one my colleague does, which is every time he hears somebody else's phone ping, which of course happens all around us these days, instead of being annoyed by it, my colleague Alex says, treat it like it's a meditation bell and someone else's phone has reminded you to take a breath. Mm. Uh, but that yeah. idea of yeah, bundling an intention to something you already do is, is really powerful. Are there and any I, other examples like brushing teeth? What else would you share as little yeah. ideas there? So for me, the what I do every single morning is before I even get out of bed. So I, I leave my phone. There's no phones in the bedroom. This was this was definitely a fight in the family, but there's no phones in anyone, even the children's bedrooms. No one's allowed to have a phone in the bedroom. So we have a place for phones. Um, so when I first wake up in the morning, before I get out of bed, I always put my hand on my heart, my, it releases oxytocin. It's good for you. And I always start with a practice of just greeting myself with kindness, setting my intention for the day and just having it while I'm still in that kind of hypnagogic state, right? When you're, when you're first waking up, your brain is in an alpha theta state, which is very suggestible and very trainable. It's this, this beautiful time to imprint. And so instead of taking your phone or instead of looking at the news or even thinking about your agenda, what you have to do that day, 
to just take a moment to greet yourself with kindness, to set your intention for the day. Um, it can really kind of set the whole course of your day. So I really encourage people before they get out of bed to do something. It's, you know, just for 30 seconds. Yeah. And I saw someone else suggest in the chat that mindful walking, you know, do something where you're outside physically active. It could be a great habit. I walk the dog in the morning. So I often, I often have podcasts on, but I'll take a pause and just sort of notice the beautiful surroundings I'm in that I would otherwise have potentially been taking for granted and do some breathing. Um, let's come on though to perhaps an even better way of building habits, which is to start young. You know, our adult brains can change, but I think we all know that our children's minds can be rewired and are rewired and wired for the first time really powerfully. What You've written a book intended for the next generation, if you like. What Tell us a bit about that and why it's important. Yeah, I'm so excited about it. And I love the way you phrased it is really about forming habits young, because why, why not, right? Wouldn't all of us as parents want to teach our children these you know, neural pathways of compassion and of kindness towards ourself and of connection with greater community. And so as I've been studying neuroplasticity, I got really interested in brain development, especially in the early years of life. That's when, you know, children don't even have to try. They just absorb language. They absorb information. And so I've written a children's book. It's called Good Morning, I Love You, Violet. And it's about a little girl's journey into self-kindness. And it was interesting when you were reading in the chat, all these habits, what really stood out to me is this judgmentalness and especially of ourselves. And I think so many of us as adults have grown into just, it's the norm to judge and berate and shame yourself. And yet it's so unhelpful and so unhealthy. And so if I had a wish for every child in the world, it's that they were kind to themselves, that that it was natural to be on your own team, to be your own ally instead of your own inner enemy. And so that's what the book is about. And I'm very excited about it and really hope that every child can, can have a copy. Yeah, it's got a beautiful uh, cover design, which I've seen. I've not actually seen inside it yet. And of course, Good Morning, I Love You, I think was the name of your, your book for adults as well, wasn't it? So this is a building on that. So we'll sh we'll send around tomorrow to everyone who's part of this event, including those who signed up but couldn't actually be with us live, a link to this, this conversation and also to your website, your fantastic TED Talk, but also to both the books, including this one for, for young people. Uh, I think it's a really hopeful message. I feel as a parent, I, I could and should be doing so much more to help cultivate this, um, these skills in, in, in my children. But I hope that they also pick up on it a little bit through, um, you know, they say that children do what you, copy what you do, not what you say. <laughs> so I tried to practice. Um, let's, um, let's come to questions because um, there are lots of people who want to ask you things. And so if you would like to post a question, use the Q&A function. And if you like someone else's question, please do upvote them because um, you can make sure that the most popular questions are the ones that we get put to Shauna. So Claire's asking about something that I think came up quite a bit in the sort of reflections from the audience. Any advice on how to interrupt rumination, especially mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So first, I'm going to recommend a book. My One of my favorite books is Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy for Depression. And I feel like Zindel Siegel, um, you know, who else wrote that book? But anyways, the number of amazing, amazing scientists and clinicians. And that's the best book I've personally read as a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. And right. one of the it talks about is, is how to interrupt ruminations. And I think the first step is really just to start to see them, just to notice them to that, that is an interruption to, instead of getting lost in them to just name it, right? Oh, there's a ruminative thought. There's a negative thinking there. My mind goes into its super highway, which they tend to become and just picking yourself up and bringing yourself back is an intervention. Okay. So I think that's one of the first steps. The second step is really to acknowledge the pain that these thoughts cause, right? And to imagine again, a dear friend, right? What would you say to a dear friend who is having that thought? How would you support her? Th the other thing I would say, and, and I use the, the image of a hot burning coal, and I imagine whenever I'm reaching for a judgmental thought or a ruminative thought, it's like I'm reaching for this hot coal and I just say, no, that will burn you. 
And I even imagine like, what would I say to my child? Like if they were doing, it? I would say, no, like there's a certain level of discipline, right? Discipline in the healthiest sense of the word where it's educating, it's caring for. And I think once we realize that these thoughts are, are harmful, um, you know, sometimes we think that self-judgment or having these negative thoughts can some way motivate us or some way make us better. But what the research shows is they don't. And so once we're clear on that, I think really having this like compassionate discipline where we say, no, that will hurt you. Thank you. I'm, I'm touched to see lots of names I recognize in the questions from people who I see regularly using the Action for Happiness app, where we have a lovely community of people that are keeping these kind of conversations going day in, day out and supporting each other. One of those is Devika, who has just asked a question that's been voted by lots of other people. Uh, says, Sean, I love your teaching. What When you said uh, what you practice grows stronger, um, but do you have any guidance around how to manage the internal conflict, discomfort and fear that when we're trying to grow new neural pathways while the old ones are still there? Yes. Change, change is hard, I guess, isn't it? Change is hard and change is scary, right? And change is a process. And so I think the most important thing, again, is to be on your own team and to not have this ideal of perfection, but to, to celebrate little micro changes, to celebrate baby steps. And that also helps, you know, calm the fear because you're not doing these huge things. It's like, can I do 5% more today? And how does that feel? And, and for me, that's been kind of a radical shift is that I tend to be someone, maybe it goes with my impatience super highway, but of like all or none. And I want it to be perfect. And I want to go hard and just realizing even doing a little bit is significant, right? One of my favorite teachers, uh, Shinzen Young, he says, subtle is significant. And I love that because it's true. Henrietta has asked how do you manage hopelessness mm. when you feel that your sort of self-judgment and shame and pain uh, will never change so when you're feeling like you're, you're sort of trying to change but it's not really going the way you'd hoped and yeah as you said it's, maybe it's a bit like this idea of spiraling a bit um how can we get beyond that yeah it's it's hopelessness is hard and I've definitely been there and I think for me, that's why the science is so compelling, is, is seeing these brains change, seeing the brain scans and realizing that it's never too late. Because I think so many of us feel like, well, it might not be too late for her, but it's too late for me. I think we have this sense of like, I'm the lost cause, maybe everyone else neuroplasticity works. <laughs> and from the scientific lens, it's just not true. It's just, you know, it's just a fact that all of us can rewire our mind. And I take a lot of hope in that. I think that's why I became a scientist and a professor is because I didn't want to just say to people, have faith in me. Um, I wanted to be able to show them the science and, and have that be the source of hope. And related to hope is a question on motivation from Zoe, who says, I know what I need to do and I know how to do it, but I still really struggle to find my motivation. Mm. So this can relate to that. So you you talked earlier on about this dopamine and this intention being a motivator, which I, yeah. I don't I'd really heard before. I tend to think of it as like a reward you get when you've done something, but actually you're you're sort of suggesting that you through our intention we can create a bit of that motivation. But can you say a bit yeah. more about motivation? Yeah. So dopamine has been often kind of villainized and misunderstood, uh, especially because it's so um, involved in the addiction pathways. But dopamine, just at the most basic level, is about motivation. And when we release dopamine, so if I think about something I care about, I, I loved Mark, you said, I, I, should, I should really be teaching this more to my children. And, and so you could feel a little self-judgment in there when you said it. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to say to you is like the clinician part of me was like, well, why? Why? What's motivating you? And then you would shift into, because I love them and I know this is powerful and I want them to have this. And there would be almost like a joy in it. Instead of the should, you'd be like, I want to teach my children this because this is going to help them thrive. When you set an intention with kindness, with um, 
something about you care instead of the sh shame and judgment, it releases dopamine. And all of a sudden you can feel that uplift that like, yes, I'm going to do this. And so when I'm working with people, we start with the motivation. We start with intention. We don't go into action until there's this energy. And like I said before, there's this cascade of neurochemistry that helps you and it pulls you out of your hopelessness and it drives you. And what's beautiful about dopamine is that, you know, the, the brain and nervous system are not stupid. So you can't lie to yourself. You can't like fake an intention or you can't like do what you think is right. It has to come from your heart. It has to be something you actually care about. And then the dopamine's right there. So I hope that helps. And what I would invite, um, I think it was Zoe, is, is to really reflect on why, why do I want to do this? What do I care about? And let your body's neurochemistry help you. Mm, so it's less about the what do I need to do, more like why am I trying to do this? Yeah, really, really helpful. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, think I, I think I've heard you already answer this partially, but Shari's just asked, is it more difficult to rewire your mind the older you are? Okay, so here we go. It is definitely easier when you're a child, okay? Before age 25, not like on your birthday, but you know, sometime before age 25, the brain is pretty plastic and you don't even actually have to put a lot of effort in to learn things. It's just naturally passively happening. Once you're 25 and older, you have to engage neuroplasticity. And what I mean by that is it doesn't just happen passively, but the good news is, the way to engage it is through setting an intention, right? You need to be motivated and you need to pay attention. So intention and attention, which are inherent in mindfulness, they are the keys that unlock neuroplasticity. The third key that unlocks it is sleep. So when you learn a new behavior, the rewiring actually doesn't happen until later that night and the next night when you're sleeping. So those are the keys for neuroplasticity. And if you're using those keys, as I said, even into your 90s, you can rewire. It's really hopeful. Thank you. I've just spotted in the chat rather than the Q&A, Amanda said, asking you, Shona, do you run any meditation or mindfulness sessions online? This talk is amazing. Just to say, one of the things we're going to share in the follow-up email is a link to your YouTube channel, where I think you do have some practices that people can, can follow. Yeah, so yeah. I have three meditations on my YouTube channel, and I've been trying to make shorter meditations in this kind of five to seven minute window, because that's what the research saying is a threshold effect. And I just want to get people going. Um, I also do teach live retreats in the US um, at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. So the, oops, those are upcoming. Um, and I you know, also always respond. So if you go to my website and you have more questions and you forgot or you think of something later, please send me a note and I promise you I will respond. And I really love hearing from all of you. Um, I, I want to end with a little wrap up exercise with the audience. And I know you want to finish a tiny bit early, Shona, because you've got to get to another important commitment. But just briefly, another valued member of our app community, Louisa, has just asked a question about, do you have any experience working with autistic clients? I think we often have people talking about autism and how that relates to their mental health and practices like mindfulness and so on. Any, any thoughts on yeah. what we talked about and autism specifically? Yeah, I don't have any personal experience, but there's been a lot of research with mindfulness and um, autism, and it's been really compelling, um, especially with children. So I've been really inspired that a lot of um, people at UCLA, Susan Kaiser Greenland has done some research there. So I would recommend exploring that. I think it's a really important avenue. Thank you so much. Um, very briefly before we just wrap up, uh, I think you've shared so much and it'd be lovely if we could all as a community just cook perhaps we'll play back to ourselves more than anything else something we'd like to take away from this is there a, a question you'd like to yeah. share to help us frame the, the nuggets we're going to take away I love that so again I'm a professor and so I care about learning so I do a lot of studying about how people best learn and what we've discovered is that what you remember from every experience not just this is the peak and the end so you remember the most important thing like whatever touched you most and then the very end and so at the end of lectures and workshops, what I like to do is have you just reflect on all the things we've talked about, all the things we've practiced and learned, and just choose one key takeaway. I call them gold nuggets. One thing that you really want to anchor in and encode in your long-term memory. So you might take a moment, close your eyes, and just kind of let all of this 
teachings, all of this experience settle in. And then maybe just reflecting on your one key takeaway. And it could be what you practice grows stronger, or it could be that shame shuts down the learning centers, or that kindness turns them on, or it could be the power of intention or the power of dopamine and motivation, or it could just be to treat yourself like you would treat a dear friend. So take one more breath in and out and just find your key takeaway. When you're ready, you can let your eyes open. And I guess if you'd like, you can write it in the chat so we can see a few of them. That's always fun. So I'm seeing uh, my key takeaway is self-compassion, um, that we have to ask ourselves why, uh, to name my feelings, to take baby steps, name it to tape it, to tame it, be on your own team, um, do more meditation. There's always hope setting a daily intention, 5% more, um, start with intention. These good are so good. <laughs> good morning, I love you. Whatever is done is done. Now what? Uh, yeah. Morning time. Yeah. No to self-judgment, hand on heart, relaxed, building on other daily habits. Tell myself I'm here for you. I'm really moved by seeing these nuggets. That's lovely. Thank you, everyone. Mm. Sean, I know you have to get away. Thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful spending time with you, learning from you. Keep up the amazing work. Is there a final thought you'd like to leave us with as we part? Mm. One, I just want to say I'm so grateful. I feel just really honored to be part of this community. It's obviously very, very engaged and I'm very touched. And I really, I think I want to just repeat what I've said before, that it's never too late, that it's never hopeless. You're never stuck. That that it's never too late to change. So one baby step at a time. Thank you so much. Let's all keep changing and building a happier and kinder world together. Thank you, Shauna. Thanks, everyone. Mm, thank you.